Now, since we have used up all the time in the first uh, sector, I will not tell you the background story of this uh, Tirokula Sutta. You can read it in the study notes, okay? Uh, going straight into the teaching. The Tirokuda Sutta, Tiro means across or outside, uh, Kuda means wall, outside the wall, Sutta discourse. This title is uh, to reflect the nature of the Petas. They're always like standing against the wall, or you try, in, in a sense, like trying to avoid where human normally, humans normally uh, move around. All right? So, this is given in verse where the Buddha teaches the nature of the pretas and of course what, uh, how we can help them and also in that way we, we help ourselves. Outside the walls they stand and then there's a square bracket wait that means you can read as or stand or wait because the Pali word on the right hand on the left hand side titanti titanti is a plural they stand okay or it can also mean they wait Outside the walls, they stand or wait at junctions and crossroads. They stand at the doorposts, having returned to their own homes. So this is the nature of the dispretas, that they, they, they are departed, but somehow they are still attached to their old uh, places, old, old situation. So there is a lot of craving, cravings for holds them back. So they wait along the walls. Uh, junctions because they are lost maybe and uh, then they stand at the door and so on okay so they return to their own homes it's, it's like they have this uh, attachment to, to something in the past food and drinks are a plenty food hard and soft are served but no one recalls them these beings conditioned by karma so here you, you can see lots of people making offerings and it, usually in the marketplace because marketplace is a meeting place of people so you you see that in Asia that's where they normally make it's very big uh, assembly with lots of food and, and so on so all these things are offered but the 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 key people, the key beings, that is the Pretas, they don't, they don't recall, we don't remember them. So if we don't remember them, you're not dedicating it to them. It obviously won't help them. So it's just a ritual. So this is one of the problems with just performing rituals without anything uh, meaningful, without remembering what it's all really about. So it has become just a social occasion without any more spiritual significance. <coughs> Thus, they give to their relatives, they who are compassionate, pure, exquisite, timely, fitting, drink and food, saying, let this be for relatives, may relatives be happy. So then there are those who, who know what to do, so they uh, give offerings and, and say, we dedicate all this to our uh, uh, departed ones. right? And they, having gathered there, they here are the, the pretas, the departed relatives gather too, right? So you, you, you have the living gathering with the departed. Right? Of course, you don't see that these departed ones. In the abundant food and drink, they wholeheartedly rejoice, right? So this word wholeheartedly can also, isakachang can also translate as respectfully, all right? So in other words, so there is this bond through giving, giving food as this bond with our ancestors or, or the departed ones uh, who are the pretas. In other words, they, they are, uh, again here, it's quite difficult to go into who really are the pretas in such a short time. We can, for the moment, take them simply as departed ones. All right? Don't think of them in any other way as ghosts or anything, just departed ones then it's easier to understand this teaching. Right? So here the, the humans reflect, or this is the, what we should think, eh, in a, feel in a positive way. Uh, but these are words that are spoken by the Pretas themselves, or at least it's the idea 
that should that would arise in the pretas, or these are the benefits that we get from the pretas by uh, thinking of them. So when they partake of these food offerings, they will feel long may our relatives live. On whose account we gain this? For honor to us has been done, and givers are not fruitless. Now notice this line: "Givers are not fruitless." It is mentioned in the previous sutta too. In other words, you know, one of the key teachings in Buddhism is that when, whenever you give something, dana, it is always there's always some karmic benefit there. So, let us recapitulate for a while. Okay, so here you have these uh, pretas that have passed away, and they are not able to get their own food. The reasons we mentioned in a moment. So for that reason, they are called hungry girls in, in, in modern Asia because they, they don't die because their karma is such, but they cannot feed. So they are often depicted as very thin, very emaciated beings. Sometimes they are depicted as leaf-thin beings. Uh, and, and because of their karma, because they've been breaking all the precepts, uh, for example, it is said that uh, they have this huge frame, but it, the mouth is very tiny, like a pinhead, so they can't really enjoy much food. Remember, all, all these are figurative descriptions. There was a time people actually believed them literally, but today I think we tend to take more of this kind of description in a figurative way of a very addictive kind of a being, a person, so someone who's not able to be happy by himself. So the Peta is like that. Now what's interesting about the Petas also is that unlike the other beings, the Petas do not have their own realm. In a sense they are like humans, and we are everywhere. So human, wherever there are humans there are also Petas, so to speak. So they, they do not have a special realm like the heavens or the animal world and so on. So they are, they, are, they can be anywhere, okay, and they are invisible. They, you, you can't see them. Uh, they, they are in the sense world, yes, but they uh, you don't you can't see them. And they, they are one of the subhuman states. They are suffering. They, they are not happy, but their own nature. One important characteristic is that they they are despondent. They are unhappy. They they are kind of depressed. So this is the one another quality. It's not just being hungry but also they're not happy they're, they're suffering uh, it's like they they want something they, this, they think they feel they've lost everything and they feel very sad so and they keep wanting those things so this is the, the prayer time now let's see some descriptions of, of uh, their situation section uh, verse 6 or verse 6 there is no farming there, nor cattle herding found. Businesses too, there are none, nor buying and selling with money. With what is given here are supported the deceased departed there. Okay? All right, just go further down, further down. Yes, down some more. Yeah. The verse is at the bottom, at the end of the text. Yeah, some more. Yes, after this. Yes, okay. There you are, yes. Okay. So there you are. Look at verse 6. What does this mean? Okay. So the, these pretas, they, they're not like us. They, there's no way they can buy food, so to speak. And, and they don't manufacture food. They, they're just there like, you know, they, they can't do anything, basically. So what does this mean? So from this verse, it means it's not helpful for us to burn things, yeah, you know, the, we have this notorious uh, uh, habit of his hell notes, we call them hell notes, and they have this paper money with many zeros, <laughs> more than the Italian lira or, or the Indonesian rupiah, and so there's a really bad inflation there, it seems. So all this burning doesn't help, because there is no farming there. Uh, you, they can use money to buy things anyway. Okay? So this is where people do not carefully study the sutta and learn how to, you know, connect. In manner of speaking, to your very simple word, to pray for the departed. 
So they, they think that by just performing a ritual, rituals uh, one month a year uh, is enough. See, so this is where uh, the, the story of the seven moon it kind of got conflated with the, the hell beings and, and, and so on, pretas and hell beings. Uh, it's as if they, they were freed during this month, you know, and, and this is the time when they will gather near our homes and that's the time we need to offer them. Okay, this, this is a popular belief, it's not a, a Buddhist belief, right? And uh, whatever you burn, even, you know, the, the Chinese have this very curious tradition where you have clothing uh, and, and houses that the rich will burn paper houses. And nowadays you even have computers and Rolex watches and whatever you see in the material world, this uh, <laughs> Joss shop will make for you and of course you have to pay for them. And, and they will burn these things believing that these burn offerings will reach the disease. But it's just a cultural thing at best here. Uh, here I remember, I always tell this story in this connection where uh, maybe this this is the kind of offering we should practice of burning paper money. There was this time they said, I think this was in Malaysia, where new notes have been produced. So there was a stack of new notes brought back by this young man to the to the house. So he left this stack of new notes uh, on the table, and the mother comes along and sees the notes. Says, Oh, this this my my fellow son has bought a stack of uh, very beautiful hell notes. So she took the whole stack of notes and burned them as offerings for the late father. And when the son comes by, I say, have you seen my notes? Say, oh, I burned them for your father. <laughs> so she has burned real notes, you know. So if you're willing to do that, then I suppose you go ahead, you know. You might also benefit the, the money, the currency of the country. But of course, you think twice when it comes to that. So this way, we begin to see sometimes rituals. Uh, we're not quite serious, we don't really see the meaning of what we are doing, we just do it without thinking. Alright, now then comes the, the educative part that the Buddha is telling us, what should we do, alright? Verse 7, just as water falling on highlands reaches down to the lowlands, even so what is given here accrues to the departed ones. So here the Buddha is trying to impress on us this natural flow of things from high level down. High level in the sense meaning uh, we have a lot of good karma and here we are uh, you know, making these offerings in memory of the departed, dedicated to the departed. So there is th this merits. Okay? So at this point we often make another mistake. This is uh, started by the Sinhalese monks. Uh, there's a transfer of merits, but the thing is, uh, there is no such teaching in the suttas. You can't transfer merits. Merits cannot be transferred for the simple reason they are not material things. Uh, you cannot transfer good. You cannot transfer wholesome karma from one person to another. Although some later Buddhism tell you, oh, all this can be done, and, and they even you know specify the rituals. This is not found in the suttas. So these are later teachings, uh, which we do not accept. So we cannot transfer merits. All we can do is dedicate the merits, and it works that way. We will find out in a moment. Okay. So the Buddha continues, verse eight, about merit, nature of merit. Just as the swollen rivers fill the ocean full. Okay. Here again, notice this uh, idea of plenty. The merits we can't count them. Even so, what is given here accrues to the departed ones. Right? So, what we do here benefits the, the pretas. Remember, only the pretas, not the devas, not the animals, not humans who are born elsewhere. And the devas don't need it anyway. Now, next verse 9 is how we should offer. This is an example of loving kindness, practice of loving kindness. When we give, when we do this prayer, when we make this offering, when we do this dedication of merit for the, our departed ones, we reflect in this way. He gave to me, 
he worked for me, a relative friend and companion to me. Give offerings then for the departed, recalling what they have done before. Recalling what they have done before. So this is gratitude in, in a sense, right? We do this because they've been kind to us in some way, uh, they have been related to us, okay? Now look at the second line, relative, friend or companion. Uh, you can take it as meaning this person has passed away is a relative, friend and companion all in one. Or you can take it to mean they are different people. They can be relatives, they can be friends, they can be someone we know very well. So it need not be just relatives. Re remember that in this long, long samsara, we have somehow been connected to one another, somehow. So we well, we can dedicate merits to even friends who have passed away. And indeed, we should even dedicate merits to enemies who have passed away, so that in the future, in the next life, when we meet again, we'll be friends, right? Instead of continuing becoming sansaric enemies, that'd be really terrible, be suffering, right? Why, why transfer our suffering to the next life? It is silly, isn't it? So this is uh, the benefit of uh, doing merit, so to speak. We, we can dedicate these merits for the benefit of others in this way. Now the Buddha is talking about the psychological aspects, what we should do, what we should not do, psychosocial aspect. Number 10, verse 10. Neither weeping nor sorrowing, nor any lamenting by others too. They help not the departed. The departed relatives remain the same. Alright, so here the Buddha is saying, uh, you don't have to make a big show, right? Uh, this is very interesting because to, to the Chinese especially, it's very important to cry out loud, you know, and it shows that you actually respect and love the disease. If you don't, they, they will gossip and say, oh, you know, this person doesn't love the disease. Now, that's not true, okay? Now, second line, any lamenting by others. You find some of these rich families, they even uh, rent this uh, professional mourners to cry. So, so it gives this really uh, amazing uh, kind of atmosphere to the funeral and then the, the crowd will say, wow, look at them, and they're so feeble and so on, but it's really a show. So lamenting by others do not help. Uh, they do not help the departed. In fact, the departed, I mean, it, this departed looking on, they say, oh dear, what are these people doing? They won't be happy anyway, right? So, their state is the same. They won't change. That's the meaning here. Okay, so, this is not the right way to help them. Right, so, now we come to the last two paragraphs. So, these last two are the proper way of dedicating merits to them. Verse 11. But when this offering is made, well placed to the Sangha given, will be for them good for a long time, will be for their good for a long time. It serves them now as well. Right? So this is how you get married. They, they cannot actually receive the physical things that we offer because of their nature, they are of a different realm, although they are all of the sense world, but they are of a different realm. But when we offer to the virtuous members of the Sangha, to good monks in other words, then you generate this kind of very good feeling, like what you're doing in metta meditation. It is that feeling they can get, they can receive. That's what the offering does. Okay, So that's why we want to offer to good monks, virtuous monks, those who keep the precepts. Right? So it won't be helpful if you give to false monks, fake monks. Of course you can also make offerings to needy people, people who need help, old folks home, and you say, I'm doing all this for the benefit of the departed, my beloved ones. Right? So you do good deeds in their memory, dedicated to them. That's the meaning here. Now the last verse says, this duty to relatives has been shown on how best to honor the departed. Notice how best to honor the departed. Uh, strength too has been given to the monks. Here the monks represent the, the Sangha as a whole, okay, including nuns also, novices. 
not small is the merit accrued to you. So this also benefits us. Notice the last line says benefits us too. So this is a mutually benefit kind of action by number one, remembering the goodness of our ancestors, the departed ones, and keeping that in mind, the goodness they have done, we too do good in their name and we dedicate that goodness to them. So what is it that transform the pretas into uh, happier beings, maybe reborn as happy human beings or even go to higher realm, is the loving kindness that we show. So whenever we will perform this kind of uh, ritual or this offering, this dedication, loving kindness is very important. Notice how we, we're not told these things, we, we forget this, right? So very often all these uh, last night rituals are very noisy and people don't really like doing it, you have to do it, you know. So when someone has passed away in our family, it is best we ourselves perform the last rites. It's like sending, you know, we, we welcome a baby into our family. So this is a time when we bid goodbye to someone we care for to be reborn. So we gather together and we share, we, we cultivate and share this loving kindness to this being who is departing. Remember, and this is very important and surprising, there really is no dead beings. No one is dead really because they are reborn. So we, we say worship the dead, there's no dead to worship. They are either reborn as animals in a hell suffering state, or in, in the human state, or animal state, or preta state, or human, uh, devas, you see. So in a sense, th there are no dead to worship, right? So we don't worship the dead in that sense. We are concerned that, th that there is this group of beings called the pretas who are stuck, still stuck to this world because of their craving and so on. We do not know who they are. We are not certain and the Buddha says there is always some relatives. It may not be our immediate one, may not, may not be the one who just passed away, but there are others who are there. So when we do this kind of uh, dedication of merit with loving kindness, we can help such beings. But because the strength of our loving kindness is not strong, we find there are so many such beings, right? So they, they only benefit the immediate ones. So we've got to keep on doing this, keep on doing this, and make sure it is focused and and we do it as a, as a community, it's even better. You can do it alone, yes, but if you can do it in a, as a community, you, you find this, uh, the, the feeling of it is much stronger. And, and in that way, we, we can dedicate to even more uh, past relatives, the pretas, in that sense, okay? So they are made happy. That's how they drop from their suffering state. And by them becoming happy, they also bless us. They say, oh, wonderful, my relatives. Right? So they, they, everyone is happy. So it's a happy, happy, win-win situation in this case. We, we don't see our pretas as very dark, unhappy beings. You know, the, the way that uh, there is this folk worship is as if our relatives are consigned to hell forever. And every seven moon we, we kind of hope they are well, but we know or we think that they are stuck there in that permanent state, so to speak. So this is wrong view, wrong belief. The proper way is to show loving kindness together by acting good ourselves, remembering the good in our relatives. And in that way, both sides are happy. So that is the way we put this. Reflect and dedicate merits to the pretas. Okay, so I'll end here at the moment so you can ask questions and we.